I guess the first question to you, Dan, would be um, a little bit the backstory of Dan Pink. And this is beyond what I hear or what I see on the about. I mean, I know you've obviously I've, I've read your books. I know you've written a bunch of books and uh, I understand you've also been a speechwriter. But I think it will be nice to go back a little further and understand when you decided you wanted to be an author, if at all you did, and sort of why you ended up doing what you're doing uh, today. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I started, I mean, I actually, you know, I, I went to university, I went to law school, I, I went to law school here in the States, law school is a graduate degree. Yes. I, de I decided I didn't want to practice law, and so I worked in politics for a while. Uh, that was what I was keenly interested in. Yeah. And then I became quite sick of it and decided that I wanted to do something else. And the whole time I'd been writing my own stuff on the side. And I finally decided to take what I was doing on the side and make it what I was doing in the center. And that's, 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 that's a story. So, I, you know, it was a sort of, it was, um, there wasn't a kind of an epiphany when I woke up, bolted upright in bed and said, I want to write books. It was a, a much slower kind of process. So I guess, the, you know, I guess the leading question is, you've written about a bunch of what seems to me fairly diverse topics, even though they have sort of a work and professional life thread to it. Yeah. And uh, so what drives the subject of these books? Is it a sort of scratch your own itch sort of thing where you have a question and you set about answering it? Or you know, driven by publisher. What is the whole? How do? You, what is the process? Mostly that yeah, no, it's it's really it's really mostly that. Um, it you know, I've I've found that it's 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 really kind of foolish to try to game the market to sort of try to come up with something you think is going to be popular because you're always going to be wrong. So you're much better off doing stuff you're interested in, stuff you're curious about, stuff that, as you say, scratches your own itch. And then doing a really good job of that. I think that it's important. I think that a lot of folks don't extrapolate enough from their own experience. I always figure if I'm interested in something, other people will be interested in it because I'm not that special, you know. Um, and, uh, and and so that's that, that's really what it was. There is, I mean, there is a little bit of connective tissue um, um, between the books in that uh, a lot of times a a book is the product of some questions that it's predecessor raised right so for instance when i wrote a book called a whole new mind about yep. the move toward more um right brain artistic yep. empathic kind of thinking yep. one question that i got from people was okay this is great how do you motivate people to how do you motivate and manage people to do that kind of work compared to the more algorithmic work and that is one of the things that got me down the path of studying motivation which i wrote about oh, in the book drive, drive. yeah then in the book drive which talks about how certain kinds of incentives that we rely on, uh, in the, especially in the workplace, are good for certain kinds of tasks, but not so good for other kinds of tasks. People, readers ask me, okay, is, is, it, is it interesting, assuming that you're more right than wrong, what about sales? And that's one of the things that got me to write about sales. So, um, so it really is just um, a combination of stuff I'm curious about, stuff that I want to spend my time on, and then... Um, and a lot, but a lot of times the things that I become curious about, that my curiosity is piqued by questions I get from readers about existing stuff. Hmm. Perfect. So now I'm, I, I guess a bunch of questions on to sell as human, uh, because, you know, so at least the way I, I read your books, is I read drive first and then a whole new mind and then to uh -huh. sell as human. So kind of a randomish order. So a bunch of, bunch of them here. So the first one is actually from a friend. Uh, it's, it's to this point where you say, Potential, emphasizing potential is probably more imp important than emphasizing experience, right? So we're more likely to go for what could be the next big thing rather than the next big thing itself. So the question from our is, you know, when we run into interviews and, and jobs and moving people, we constantly get into what she calls the experience wall. Uh, now how do we practically or how have you practically seen people get around that, uh, you know, when somebody just says, I want so and so and so and, you know, you just don't fit? Yeah, uh, well, that's that um, on the on the first point. That's not my you know opinion. It's, yeah. it's really what some of the you know it's really research. what the research shows is that people are more tend to be more persuaded by potential than by by by, pre, by previous experience. Um, how people get around that is, um, you, you know, I think what they do is they make a good case to the interviewer that that. They essentially play it on different terms. Yeah. So um, they basically try to make a case to the interviewer 
that they, meaning that the interviewee, yeah. will make the other person's life easier, not harder. Hmm. Um, and that they might not have the, you know, they, they leave aside the means, that is the actual experience, and focus on the ends, and essentially try to make the case that they can de tackle the problems that the interviewer faces. Yeah. Um, I'm really, um, um, so there are a couple of dimensions. I think the first is, the, is, um, is that I, I think in job interview, I really, I mean, I don't want to reduce it too simplistically, but I really do think that a lot of times in job interviews, the, the interviewer is, is basically saying, is this person going to make my life easier or is this person going to make my life harder? Right. And if you can sort of be the kind of person who people say, oh, my God, this person's going to make my life easier, I think that's advantageous and I think that can actually trump um, a lack of experience. Um, the other side of this is that there's a, there's a growing body of, of evidence showing that uh, previous accomplishment and experience, um, not only are they less persuasive than, they, than, we, than we think, but mm -hmm. uh, much weaker predictors of subsequent success than we think. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of research on this. Uh, there's a guy at Harvard named Boris Grossberg who, who did a, you know, who found that a lot of, he, he did a study of, of uh, financial analysts, yeah. uh, of securities analysts. Yeah. And one of the things that he found, and, you have, these star, you have these securities analysts, and there's um, 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 some of the financial press and s some other kind of organizations have essentially ratings. They yes, basically yes. put an all-star team of yeah. financial analysts. Yeah. And so someone who is a someone who is a financial analyst is an all-star. They get they ended up getting hired away quite a bit. Yeah. And he found it was very rare for someone to 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 go from the all-star ranking, get hired away, and continue being an all-star. And a th the theory behind that is that a lot of that person's performance was about the context of being in that particular place. Yeah. Uh, that it wasn't that his or her skills were completely um, distinct and completely portable that you could take somewhere else, that they were actually hinged to the context of that organization. And so I just think in general, we're, 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 we're rethinking how much experience and previous accomplishment even you know not, again not the, not the only the persuasive power of them but actually the predictive power of them i think is coming into question fair enough fair enough so dan i'm just just making sure i i i, I just want to actually make sure that uh, i just want to make sure that i'm not a black blob uh I, i'm at my new house so i'm still trying to find a good place to interview yeah I can see, <laughs> fine ah okay perfect um so got it so, so the next question is so this is one I'm personally very interested in, right? So you, I, I, you, you always go out, you interview a whole bunch of people, um, and then you know, I guess you form form an opinion and, and make a great structure. So I'm sure with selling, you've interviewed sales stars all over the place, and you've gone in with the with the implicit assumption that a lot of selling can be taught, or at least with the assumption that we can all get better as salespeople. Now, I guess the next question to you would be, you know, how much of, how much of the stars you saw were innate versus learned? So how much of it was nature in your view and how much nature? Absolutely. And you know what? I actually, not only did I spend time with some of those great salespeople, but I asked them that very question. Okay. Um, because, um, because there is a view out there that some people are, quote unquote, naturals. Yes. You know, that guy could sell anything. Yes. And it's really amazing to me, Rohan. Um, so, I, so, so, so I asked this particular question to them. Yes. Are some people just born salespeople? Yeah. And their view, very almost uniformly, was no. Okay. Um, that um, uh, especially now, and the reason for that was that so much of sales today, when consume, when when buyers, whether they're business buyers or consumer buyers, prospects again, whether they're in the business, you know, B two B or B two C. Uh, when when they have access to so much information, what matters more on the seller part is is expertise. Yeah. Um, and and that's something I heard over and over again, particularly in B two B. Expertise, expertise. You have to have expertise. And and what they're saying is like you you know you're just you're not born an expert in computer systems. You're not born an expert in uh, luxury sedans. Um, you you acquire that, you yeah. you build that, and you actually have to have some interest in it in order to in order to do it. Yeah. So um, so the very best salespeople out there really, I mean, in numbers that surprised me. I mean, you know, vast vast majority of them said no. Uh, it's not. You know, it's I I don't really think that there are some people who are 
who are naturals. I think it's something that that people that people learn how to do. The other thing that that, that fits into that is this idea of um, some of the research that I write about from Adam Grant at Penn about yes. introversion, extroversion. Yes. And you know this, so we have this stereotype that the naturals are these super extroverted people. Yeah. And what Grant's research has found and others have found is that that's not it. Yeah. And the people who do the best are in the middle, the ambiverts. And most of us are ambiverts. Which yeah. Suggests. It sort of in a, sort of the flip side of that is that well most of us are kind of sort of naturals because it's what human beings do. Hmm. Fair enough. Okay. So 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 I guess the next one next one to you is I, I've I've interviewed a few authors and I've actually been very surprised by uh, their motivations. Like for example, when I when I asked Roy Baumeister as to how willpower uh, changed his life, he said, you know. I, I research for the sake of researching, not necessarily for a concept to change my life. And, and I think the question to you is, you know, have there been insights from your books and specifically, I guess, to sell as human and drive that have changed the way, I guess, changed your life slash changed the way you think or changed the way you work? Yeah, I think there have. I mean, maybe I'm sort of the, you know, the... Dan, you know, Dan sorry. Different... Sorry, I'm just going to pause. Ah, okay. Your, your video po- uh, stopped for a second. Uh, but anyway, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I think that, I mean, I actually have a different point of view than, than, than Roy has. I, or di- not even a point of view, a different set of experiences. Yeah. Uh, uh, it has. I mean, um, if, if you think about, I mean, especially on this latest book, um, a number of different things. First of all, I, I've, I've been very, I've been very, I was very, very taken by the, the research showing the persuasive power of questions. Mm-hmm. And how questions, because they elicit an active response, get the other side's wheels turning, that you can actually be more persuasive, move people more adroitly by posing questions rather than by making statements. And so I found myself using questions more. Um, the whole the, There's some great research that I write about with regard to pitching um, and the change my, my view of pitching. My view of pitching was very much you pitch to convert. All right? yeah. So I make a pitch to you. And I'm trying to get you to yeah. give me a thumbs up, give me a green light. And what the research showed is that that is not the way that that's not what pitching is. Pitching yeah. is inviting people into a conversation. So that changed the way I that absolutely changed the way that I um, changed the way that I I pitch ideas mm-hmm. um, on on drive um, the um, the some of the material on. On mastery, I mean, I wrote a little bit about grit before it was, you know, now everybody's written about grit now, but I wrote a little bit about grit, and I was very persuaded about that in terms of um, uh, how I talk to my kids and and what kind of uh, values and things I want to encourage in my kids, and I want them to, you know, I want them to be gritty. Um, I was very taken by the research, uh, came a little bit later on the importance of and mastery of making progress, and so Mm -hmm. I've done some things in my own life using some software called uh, our service called I done this to help me make sure I measure my own progress. So, um, so, so definitely. So, so I, so, so for me, it's, it's like, you know, I mean, true. I mean, it goes sort of to your other question, which is, which is, I mean, I like, you know, I, I write books that I would like to read. Hmm. One reason that I write books is that there's not a, like, I want to read something about this particular topic and learn something about this topic and no one else has done it yet. So well, I got to do it myself. So, so now uh, you've written about, I guess, a, a whole bunch of books, and and you've always gone depth into depth to the, you know, in terms of uh, in terms of topic. Do you have a certain process that you follow now that that you feel like you've knocked down to a T uh, when you when you when you kind of open up a new question? And second, how do you know a question is going to be good enough for for an entire book, or or is it that you do you try out many ideas and then one of them goes much farther than the others? Yeah, uh, two excellent questions. Let me take the second one. Let me take the second one first. Um, um, you don't know whether anything is going to be. You don't know any whether anything is going to be um, a great idea. And so, well, let, so so what I do essentially is this: is that I have. Um, I'm sort of a pack rat of sort, digital and paper pack rat, and that I keep a little notebook with me, write down ideas in a notebook. I have idea files on my, I'm, I'm talking to you on my laptop right now, you know, yeah. something in Dropbox and uh, an email file. I have over here in my desk here a paper file. So I just keep a bunch of ideas and shards of things that I go through periodically. Mm-hmm. And then that, so then it becomes kind of a funnel. Then I funnel down like that and say, okay, here are 
you know, I mean, right now I think I have a running list of, um, I don't know, you know, 16 or 17 book ideas. Okay. And a lot of times when I revisit those ideas, and I'll revisit those ideas periodically, when I revisit those, when I revisit those ideas, sometimes I'm just shocked at how bad some of them are, you know, so <laughs> I, you know. I, I'm a big believer, no joke, in that the only way to have good ideas is to have a lot of ideas. Yes. And so, you know, so I'll look at I'll look at that that kind of big list of I'll look at that big list of things, and then I'll also see what stays on the list over time because I'm always kind of pruning that list. Mm-hmm. And so, if something stays on the list for a decent amount of time, um, you know, that that gives me a hint that it might be something worth pursuing. Um, and then, um, you know. Typically, the way that I do things for for a book is that I'll write a proposal, and and I, and I end up writing pretty long proposals. I mean, that this is all inside base, inside insider uh, um, tactic tactical stuff. But yeah. you know, when you sell a book proposal, here's yeah. the book I want to write, and I I actually end up writing fairly lengthy proposals, yeah. partly because it's a test for me about whether there's a there there and whether I'm interested enough to do it. There's some things, there's some topics that are interesting enough for an article, but not interesting enough for a book. Yeah. And you don't want to go down the path of having something that you're interested enough for an article and then commit to writing a book about it. Yeah. So the one check on that is writing a proposal, which is like, you know, cause I've written, I've written, um, uh, I have written proposals before where I got, you know, well over halfway through and said, I'm not interested in enough in this, or this is a really bad. This is a this is not as strong an idea as I thought, and yeah. I abandoned. Hmm. Um, and then um, so so that's so it's sort of a it's a little bit of a funneling. It's a it's a little bit of a funneling process. Um, uh, you know. Also, the other thing I mean, just to be very clear here, is that I you know I also you know think strategically about you know is there a market for this book too? Hmm. Uh, I mean, if I were keenly interested in um, in um, you know this you know, uh, collecting, collecting stamps from Estonia. And I wanted to write a book about <laughs> Estonian stamps. That might be really interesting to me, but there's no market for that. So, yeah. you know, that becomes like a hobby rather than yeah. something I, I really do. So there yeah. is, you know, I don't, there is a strategic a- a layer on it as well. In terms of the process for the books, you know, some of the books have been, It, it really depends. It really depends. I mean, in terms of writing, I'm a big believer in structure. And so I really work really hard to figure out the structure of sort of the architecture of the book. Um, and the way to do that is, depends. It, sometimes it's about doing a lot of interviews first. I've done it that way. Other times it's about actually trying to write some stuff first and, and seeing where the holes are. So um, there is, a, I don't have, a, you know, I don't have a, process necessarily about how to get it the book you know how to get the how to get it off the runway once it's off the runway then there then then i do have um you know i try to write every day write in the morning um try to hit a certain word count each day so that there's some momentum yeah. but that's only once it's you know off the runway hmm. okay perfect so, so i see an amazing bookshelf uh, have you read all those books um, let's see. Well, right behind me there, those, yeah. are, those are actually, those are actually a lot of my books. So, okay. uh, so I have, yeah. Oh, wow. Those are, yeah. So those are, you know, so, uh, that's right immediately behind me there are, are some of my books and yeah. like the four, uh, the international editions of my book. So, okay. So uh, what are your favorite books? Uh, of course, you're not allowed to cite your own. I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I mean. I, th- I think that there are a lot of I, I don't know if I have a single I don't know if I have a single favorite um, you know I mean I read a fair amount of, of books and I try to read fairly eclectically I mean if there's any if there are books that have stuck with me over time it is you know I think working by Studs Terkel would be something that stuck with me over time he's a guy who basically did a bunch of interviews with people in America about what their work is like hmm. which is sort of what I've been doing for 17 years. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I'm a, uh, I, I think that, uh, v- Victor Frankl's man's search for meaning is an incredibly important book. Yeah. Um, um, on, um, yeah, Stephen Pressfield's the war of art, I think is a really, you know, it's like a book that's been personally helpful and meaningful to me. Yeah. Um, 
but you know in general you know i like to read you know i like to read a lot and just take pieces i you know take pieces from all kinds of different kinds of books perfect and and uh, one more i guess short uh, light question before we come to the last two would be uh, what are any any favorite movies and tv shows that you'd recommend that i recommend um let's see here um i i kind of you know i, I sort of I actually really like uh, some um, short documentaries. So, like, like uh, Euro Dreams of Sushi. Oh, Euro yes. Of Sushi, which is a great one about, I think, a great thing about mastery. I just yes. saw, not, it's actually not a documentary. It's a, it's a, it's, it's based on actual events. It's a, yeah. it's a movie called, it's a movie called No, about, uh, from Chile, about, um, the campaign, you know, about a political campaign that I thought was really good. Uh, I'm a big fan of the series, series of movies by Michael Apted, Seven Up, Fourteen Up, Twenty One okay. Up, uh, which is fo- follows a group of people in the UK every seven years to see where their where their where their where their lives go. Um, on television, I mean, there's an American series called The Americans that I really like. Okay. And I like and I like Homeland. I see. Okay. And, <laughs> And that's really about it. Perfect. So I guess my final two questions, right? So one of which is you get so much, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you're extremely busy, as is evidenced by the fact that it's taken me only about a year and a half to get to you. Uh, I'd love to understand what some of your productivity hacks are in your day, right? What are, what are little routines and things you do to stay productive? Um, yeah, it's a, it's, I mean, I, I think one of the smallest and most useful things is like there's something that you can do with, if there's a task that you can complete in less than two minutes, do it now. Um, and as it, simple-minded as that sounds, it's actually really, really, um, it's extremely, extremely useful to me. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, this is not anything that novel. I, um, I try on email to basically batch my email. So when I respond, it's to respond in batches rather than let it just, uh, right. rather than let this just trickle in. And, and as I mentioned before, when I'm writing, when I have a you know, big writing assignment, um, I will, you know, I'm, I'm, my office is my garage right here. This is my garage. I'm in my garage. That's my, my office. My house is right over there. Yeah. Um, what I will do is when I'm writing is I will, I will start in the morning and um, I will, as I said before, commit to a certain amount of words. So let's say you got to create 500 words and I won't do anything else until I hit those 500 words. Okay. I won't answer email. I won't talk on the phone. I won't do anything else. And sometimes I can hit my word count. If I start at, say, 9 in the morning, I can hit my word count by 10.30. Other days, I don't hit it till 4. Um, and, and regardless, it's like, you know, so that means that if I don't hit it till 4, I got a lot of email piled up, a lot of phone calls piled up and things like that. So um, so that would be that. Uh, and as I mean, you know, I, 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 I'm, a, I, I'm, a, I'm sort of a getting things done guy, a GTD, David Allen guy. Yes. I, use a lot, I use a lot of that kind of stuff, too. Not as much as I should, but reasonably well. Perfect. Final question. What is an idea that inspires you that you'd like to share? And I, what kind of idea? What do you mean an idea? So an idea and, that, that, that it, can, it can be absolutely anything. It, 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 it could be what gets you out of bed in the morning or it could be something that you're thinking about, uh, you know, on a constant basis and, and something that will improve or make this world a better place. An idea that just inspires you or, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I'm, I'm really curious about is, um, is sort of a, sorry, a combination of demographics and um combination of demographics and developmental psychology it goes like this but there's a there's some evidence in developmental psychology that when people hit a certain age their perspective shifts pretty significantly um when they get older they 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 begin to think about what's called generativity that is basically what's their legacy going to be what's what kind of world are they going to leave um so some evidence in that so someone, I'm not that I'm not at that age yet, but but sort of the trajectory, particularly when people aren't struggling for, assuming people aren't struggling for survival, is you know they're sort of making their way, making their way, building a life, and then at a certain point they say, well, wait a second, it's not so much about the day to day, it's about what my legacy is going to be, what kind of world I want to leave, and um, you know that's not that it's not a, like a brilliant insight in developmental psychology, but I think that it's accurate. And I think what's interesting, if you combine that with the demographics, the demographics of the world where you have an aging pot, the number of people who are aging is higher than any time in human civilization. I think the combination of those two things is potentially really, really powerful. 
Fantastic, Dan. Thank you so much. Let's 